Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting Great British Road Journey. This week we're still in Northamptonshire, which may be hard to believe given my quiet countryside surroundings, but I can assure you it gets a lot shitter later on. Our journey today takes us from Wollaston to Daventry, and as always, to help navigate our way there, we'll be using a copy of my 1923 Michelin guidebook, period correct maps, and we'll be stopping along the way to take in some of the finer things Northamptonshire has to offer. We start then in Wollaston, a small village that in 1923 had a population of only two and a half thousand. It's not grown much since then because today the population is only three and a half thousand. This makes you wonder why this small village gets a mention in my guidebook, but back then, despite not having many residents, Wollaston was a very busy place, predominantly within the shoe and boot industry, much like the rest of Northamptonshire. The first boot factory would arrive in Wollaston in the 1880s. Today known as Solivare, initially it was set up as a cooperative business between local cobblers. Their most notable work would come in the 1960s when a collaboration between organisations would see the creation of the Dr Martin boot, a perhaps now well famous piece of footwear loved by scar bands and the EDL. Amazingly, the original factory that was set up in the 1880s is still in place today and they're still manufacturing footwear, so that's a nice little success story for Wollaston. Also in Wollaston is Bell End. It's a very short road that's named after the Bell Inn, which is an old pub that no longer exists. Surprisingly, my guidebook makes no mention of such hilarities, but it does suggest when visiting Wollaston, one might like to take a trip to see Strixton Church. This isn't actually in Wollaston, but whatever, here it is. It was built in the 13th century, but in 1873, it was mostly rebuilt, leaving only a small piece of the original church. It's known as St. Romwald's Parish Church. However, looking at some old maps, we can see that it's noted down as St. John's Baptist Church. So which is right? It's the first one, St. Romwald's. Around the time of the church's rebuilding in 1876, attempts were made to change the name of the church to St. John's. An excellent choice if you ask me, but it seems nobody else thought the same, so the name never really caught on and they reverted back to using St. Romwald's fairly quickly. Our next destination is Wellingborough, and looking at our old maps, it's a simple drive up the A509 and boom, we're in Wellingborough. Not before passing underneath the A45 though, a dual carriageway that was built in the 1980s to bypass the town. Once you pass the A45, keep an eye out on the right for a lovely structure built in 1886. It's called Victoria Mills and it's the creation of John Batum's Whitworth and his two brothers who set up a mill to make flour. It was actually built out of necessity. Prior to its construction, John Whitworth was already making flour at a mill in Turvey, Bedfordshire, but it was destroyed in a fire, resulting in Whitworth finding the site here at Wellingborough and building a new mill. The site he chose was perfect because it sat alongside the River Nen or Neen and according to old maps, it was also next to Wellingborough Railway Station, so shipping things in and out was a piece of cake. In the 1930s, the wheat that they used to make the flour would arrive on barges, and whilst details are limited, I believe it was supplied by the Weetabix company who set up a factory not too far away in Burton Latimer. My guidebook recommends that when in Wellingborough, one should pay a visit to see All Hallows Church, and we will, but before we do, I've come to the edge of a very dodgy housing estate, of which there are several in Wellingborough, and I'm on the hunt of what's known as Red Well. There it is. When it comes to Wellingborough, the clue is in the name, Wells in the Borough, and indeed, when it was a medieval town and much smaller, it was surrounded by five wells, something that's represented in the Wellingborough coat of arms. These five symbols represent the five wells that the town was founded on. It may not be clear on camera, but you can see here where the water is coming through the ground. Isn't nature clever? Oh, f dogs. As for All Hallows Church, I'd have probably skipped over it since we already looked at a church a little bit earlier, but this is said to be the oldest building in Wellingborough, having been built in 1160. The 160 foot high tower that we see today was added a bit later in the year 1280, but in any case, it's several hundreds of years old. Leaving Wellingborough today is a simple matter of jumping on the A45 and away you go. However, in the old days, the A45 as we know it didn't exist. Our route will take us out of Wellingborough via the A5128 and A4500, and the combination of these two roads used to make up the A45 before it was replaced in the 1980s with the current A45. According to our old maps, we'll pass through the villages of Great Billing and Western Fable, but today that's not the case as they've been consumed by the mighty town of Northampton. There's around 250,000 people living in Northampton, making it one of the largest towns in the country. In the days of my guidebook, there were fewer people, but with 90,000 residents, it was still quite a large town. My guidebook mentions Cock. 
It is, of course, referring to the Cock Hotel and Inn. What were you thinking of? It's found on Queen's Park Parade, but what I've actually come to look at is found outside and opposite the hotel. This is one of two tram shelters to be found in Northampton. Between 1901 and 1934, Northampton had its own electrified tram service with around eight miles of track. Blimey, the sun just came out, I can't see. Trams had actually been operating around Northampton for some time prior to this. In 1880, the Northampton Street Tramways Company was set up and they would operate a horse-drawn tram service. They would then later be bought out by the Northampton Corporation Tramway Company in 1901. In 1904, they would construct a tram depot in the St. James area of Northampton, a building that still survives to this day. Over the years, the Northampton Corporation would progress from trams to motor buses, leading to the withdrawal of the electrified tram service, and the depot was converted to suit buses rather than trams. Bus services would continue from here for many decades, but sadly, it all came to an end in 2013. Since then, the building has sat abandoned, but more recently has been purchased by West Northamptonshire Council, who will benefit greatly when they flip it to a property developer. Remember I said one of two tram shelters? Well, number two is found by Northamptonshire Racecourse. Now, a racecourse sounds incredibly exciting in the middle of Northamptonshire, but sadly, the reality is slightly different. Where I'm standing now used to be a racecourse, but for horses, it all came about as the result of tradition. People have been racing horses just for fun on this bit of land for centuries, and eventually it just turned into a race course. Unfortunately, it would all come to an end in 1904 because people kept dying. The race course was intersected by several footpaths and stupid people kept getting hit by racing horses, so they put a stop to that and converted the race course to a park area. In more modern times, the park would regularly make the news because it became an area associated with a high level of robberies and assaults. Lovely. With that in mind, let's get out of Northampton and like before, we'll be heading along the A4500, which used to be the A45. This section of road has been upgraded more recently to a dual carriageway and in doing so, little bits of the original road have been left over as access roads or laybys. For example, Southview. This used to be the main road before any upgrades. It used to run right past these houses and then through the trees along what is now a footpath. If you follow that footpath along for a bit, you might find this abandoned road that we looked at on the channel some time ago. I suppose it's not really an abandoned road, it's more a road that was built and then not used. The idea was that they were going to build a load of houses and this abandoned, not abandoned road would have connected them all up. Instead, they seemed to have moved the house building a little bit to the north, meaning they had to build some new road. Why not use what was already there? It doesn't really make any sense. In any case, eventually it will all be connected up and open to the public, but nobody seems to know quite when that will be. A short distance from there is Junction 16 of the M1 motorway, which at the time of my guidebook's release very much didn't exist. This bit of the M1 motorway wouldn't come until the late 1950s as part of the first section of M1 to open. More recently, in 2018, a new road was built connecting up to Junction 16. It's a new A45, and before its construction, the main road and route used to run through Upper Hayford, Floor and Weedon, some very small villages that weren't designed with modern traffic levels in mind. So they built a bypass around all of these villages, and that's that problem solved. Except it probably isn't, because this road wasn't really built as a bypass as such. It's a road that one day will see a f ton of development along its length, of course increasing the levels of traffic in the area, making what's currently a very useful road useless. Of course, sticking to our old maps, we can't use that useful new road and instead we'll take the route through Upper Hayford and all the other small villages. There's not much to see along the way until we get to the village of Weed and Beck. Where my guidebook suggests looking at the Ordnance Depot. Okay. Built in 1803 and known as the Royal Military Depot, it was used as a 500 personnel barracks and also for storage of small arms and ordnance. Its location was chosen because it was a long way from any sea or coastline, meaning it was less likely to be invaded by opposing forces. Running down the centre of the site is a canal that was installed to allow for easy unloading and loading of goods and it would connect up to the nearby Grand Union Canal. At the other end, the canal would have continued a short distance to a barge turning point, although it seems that's long been since removed and infilled. The site would operate under military control until the 1960s, at which point it was closed to then be occupied by various government departments and the Home Office. Since then, a lot of the site has been sold off, but there are large sections of it that are still in use today by private businesses. As you arrive in Daventry, you're given an insight as to what Daventry is like almost immediately with this abandoned hotel and abandoned petrol station. 
It was known as the Landmark Hotel and Service Station, and it certainly is a landmark, but perhaps for all of the wrong reasons. It was constructed and opened in the mid-1970s with 100 rooms on offer. This would rise to 148 rooms following the hotel's expansion in the mid-1980s. In 2008, the hotel would close, apparently for refurbishment, but then the owners decided not to reopen the hotel due to personal reasons. The massive 2008 recession, I imagine, that might have had something to do with it. The hotel was put on the market in 2019 for £7 million. A bargain if you ask me, and you even get your own petrol station. I believe it used to be branded as a Merco petrol station, and whilst it would have operated independently, the fuel would have come from the Merco refinery in Milford Haven. Surprisingly, my guidebook makes no mention of an old petrol station. However, what it does suggest is when visiting Daventry, leave Daventry immediately and go and visit the ruins of Dower House, which are found to the south of Daventry near Badeby. The house hasn't been lived in since 1704, and looking at it, yeah, I'd say that's fairly apparent. It's said that the house and woodlands next door are haunted. The story goes that a jealous husband shot dead his cheating wife inside Dower House before burying her in the nearby Baby Woods. It's believed that the ghost of Mrs Fitzgerald still haunts the house and woodland area to this very day. A load of crap. And there we are then, guys. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is, of course, a button specifically for that. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so. That'd be wicked sweet. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John. You've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting Great British Road Journey. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.